In section 12.3, we turn our attention to metallic bonding. You might recall from chapter 8 that we discussed both ionic and covalent bonding at some length, but at that time we put off a discussion of metallic bonding. In this short section, we're going to return to that concept. So one way to think about metallic bonding is to understand the way that elements or atoms bond to each other depending on the number of electrons per atom. So thinking back to our Lewis structures, right, if we were to start with an element from group 7A like chlorine, it has seven valence electrons and therefore it's going to be able to form one bond to complete its octet. If we move to group 6A, an element like sulfur, then it only has six valence electrons, and so therefore it needs to form two covalent bonds to complete its octet. Hence, elements like sulfur form two bonds. Here in sulfur, we get a ring containing eight sulfur atoms with each sulfur bonded to two neighbors. When we go to group 5A, elements like phosphorus and arsenic and nitrogen, then we need to make three bonds to complete our octet. And phosphorus has various allotropes. This one is the molecular one, white phosphorus, where the four phosphorus atoms form a pyramid. The others have sheets or ribbons, but the common feature of all of the allotropes of phosphorus is each phosphorus atom is forming three bonds to its neighbor. If you think about a molecule like nitrogen, nitrogen has a triple bond, so once again forming three bonds to its neighbors. Then we come to silicon, carbon, germanium, these have four valence electrons, and therefore they need to form four covalent bonds to complete the octet. But once we get to aluminum, where we have only three valence electrons, there really just aren't enough valence electrons per atom that you can get to an octet by forming covalent bonds. And when that happens, we form metallic bonds. So the characteristic feature of basically all of the metals is that they are deficient or lacking in enough valence electrons to form covalent bonds to complete the octet. And instead what they do is they form closely packed structures, as we learned in the last section, and they share the valence electrons collectively. Now the simplest model for understanding this is called the electron C model. And the idea of the electron C model, which is illustrated in this image, is that if you have an element like aluminum with three valence electrons, we could think of that as having ionic cores that might be plus three, or if it were sodium, they might be plus one. And then all of the valence electrons are basically spread out and shared amongst these ionic cores. And that sharing of valence electrons, we call that an electron C. And the thing that makes it special, different than, say, covalent network solids or ionic solids is that if we put some kind of external force that's going to push the electrons one way or the other, then they can move in response to that force. If we apply an electric field gradient, then the electrons move away from the negative potential and toward the positive potential, and that is the conduction of electricity. If we put a thermal gradient across a metal, we have a hot end and a cold end, the electrons at the hot end have more kinetic energy and they diffuse and move down to the cold end and that carries heat with them when they go. Both of those things can go together. In fact, if you have a metal with a temperature gradient, you will create a flow of electrons and in fact a potential difference. And that can be used, for example, to measure temperature. And lastly, but still importantly, this kind of bonding is very isotropic. Okay, it's the same in all directions. And because of that, it means that the planes of metal atoms can slide past one another easily. And that's what makes it possible to pull metals into long wires, to hammer them down into thin sheets, to have properties that we call malleable and ductile. Okay, but there are some limitations to the electron C model, because of course it is a very simple model. Now, in the electron C model, we would think that if the valence electrons are the glue which holds the atoms together, that the more valence electrons, the stronger the atoms will be held together. Let's take a look at the melting points of elemental metals and see if that's true. 
So starting over here at the far left in group 1A, these might be elements like sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. We can see that the melting point is relatively low. And as we increase the number of valence electrons going to group 2A, it goes up sharply. And when we go to group 3A, it goes up again. And it keeps rising, as we would expect, as the number of valence electrons increases. But something happens around the middle of the periodic table, basically when we get about to group 5 or 6. And at that point, then adding more valence electrons actually causes the melting points to decrease. And they go down and down. And in fact, if we look at this red point over here in group 2b, the melting point of that metal, mercury, is actually below room temperature. So as you know, mercury is a liquid at room temperature. So we can see that the melting and boiling points initially increase as we add more valence electrons. And that's suggesting that the metallic bonding is becoming stronger. However, in the electron C model, we would expect this to continue to go on. But what we see experimentally is that in the middle, that's where we reach the maximum bonding, and then the metallic bonding gets weaker as we continue to add more valence electrons. So how can we understand that? To do so, we have to go back to this molecular orbital picture even though metals don't form molecules, instead they're a collection of many atoms packed closely together, we can still use the orbital overlap from a molecular orbital theory to understand their bonding. So if we take an element like lithium, okay, which has one valence electron, and lithium is all the way over on the left-hand side of the periodic table, so maybe we can just think about the valence shell s orbital, the 2s orbital on lithium, if we put two lithium atoms together to form a diatomic molecule, we would fill up the bonding molecular orbital, and we would leave empty the antibonding molecular orbital. Fans of Star Trek might be disappointed to learn that dilithium doesn't exist, and if you can make it metastably, but it's present only as a gas, so if you had dilithium, it certainly would not be a crystal. But in this thought experiment here, that's you know, kind of an aside. As we go to more and more atoms of lithium, we get more and more molecular orbitals, right? The number of molecular orbitals here is going to be equal to the number of atoms in our chain. And what we see is always the most stable molecular orbital is one where all of the neighbors are overlapping in a constructive manner to give a bonding molecular orbital. And the most unstable or highest energy molecular orbital is one where all of the neighbors interact destructively to form antibonding interactions. There's a nodal plane between each pair of lithium atoms. And this will continue as we go to, from four atoms to eight atoms to 100 atoms to 1,000 atoms to a trillion atoms. But the other feature that's common is because each lithium atom has one valence electron, we'll always have just the right amount of electrons to fill up molecular orbitals that are more bonding than antibonding. Those are ones shown in blue. And we'll leave the more antibonding orbitals empty. Okay, so if we want to understand the trends in the periodic table, we have to move into the transition metals and eventually even over to some of the p-block metals. And that means that we need to think about not just the valence shell s orbitals, but also the d and p orbitals. Basically, all of these orbitals behave in a similar way. The s orbital, which can hold two electrons per atom, they overlap to form a lot of closely spaced molecular orbitals. And in a perfect crystal, actually, it's a continuum of available molecular orbitals that we're going to call a band. But this band can hold only two electrons per atom. In a similar way, the d orbitals, and there are five of those, also overlap to form bands. And, and those bands are somewhat more narrow because the d orbitals don't stick out from the atoms as much. They don't overlap as much. And so we get smaller energy difference between the most bonding and the most antibonding molecular orbitals. And this block of bands can hold 10 electrons per atom, two for each atomic orbital.
And then finally, we can get into the p orbitals. And there are three p orbitals, and they overlap also to give bands. This one is wider than the d orbitals, but maybe not quite as wide as the s orbitals. And that one can hold six electrons per atom. So if we have an atom like nickel, we have to accommodate those 10 valence electrons per nickel atom into these bands. Because the bands overlap, you can see that we don't fill up any band all the way. We have partially filled S and P and D bands. And this partially filled nature of the bands is what allows the electrons to move around. That's what makes it a metallic conductor. In terms of bonding, what we want to do is we want to fill the band up halfway. And once we go past halfway, we're filling antibonding orbitals, and that's going to weaken the bonding. So you can see that for the s orbital, we have gone past halfway. So we're not at the optimal bonding anymore. And for the d orbitals, it's the same thing. We've gone actually quite a ways past the optimal filling. And if we were to go to the next element over, copper, we would fill up the d band all the way, and the S-band and the P-band a little bit more. And so the bonding would get weaker. If we were to go to zinc, that would be the next element, we would reduce the bonding even further as we increasingly filled antibonding states. So because of that, then, we can look at this heat map of the melting points of the metals. And so you can see over on the left-hand side, the alkali metals and the alkali and earth metals, you know, those have very few valence electrons per atom, and therefore the bonding is not very strong. And interestingly, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium all melt at a temperature below the boiling point of water. Once we get into the transition metals, the melting points go up pretty rapidly, and they reach a maximum we see at group 6, chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten. And that's because those elements have electron configurations where both the S and the D shell is halfway filled. And that's optimal for bonding. You know, it's no coincidence that in incandescent lights that the filaments are made out of tungsten because you can heat tungsten up to a really high level before it melts. As we get to the later transition metals, we see that the melting points start going down again. And by the time we get all the way out of the transition metals, you know, we start to get things like gallium, which melts at 30 degrees C, or mercury, which melts at minus 39 degrees C. That's because we've got this picture down below here where we're filling the D band completely, most of the S band, and a fair bit of the P band. So the only bonding is really coming from the P band there. Okay, let's finish by having you do a kind of homework or exam question that might come up. Here are four different metals, and I want you to rank them from the lowest to the highest melting point. Obviously, you could just go back to the slide I just showed and look them up, but here I want you to do this just using the periodic table as a guide. Go ahead and pause the video, make your predictions, and then we'll come back and go over the answers. Welcome back. Okay, the key to this question is to look at the number of valence electrons and how they are going to fill up the bands that form when the valence orbitals overlap. Okay, so if we look at the number of electrons, we can see a couple of them, indium and silver, where the valence orbitals are mostly filled. And then we have a couple of others, zirconium and molybdenum, when they're basically less than half filled. Looking at this, I can say, hmm, it seems like indium, you know, we're going to get basically no bonding from the S and the D orbitals and only a little bit of bonding from the P orbitals. So that one should have the lowest melting point, and in fact, it does. If we take away a couple of electrons, two electrons to be precise, then we would have silver. Okay, so silver, at least we're getting a reasonable amount of bonding from the S orbitals now. And its melting point, in fact, is quite a bit higher. Then, when we go backwards to zirconium and molybdenum, both of those represent elements where we're less than half-filled. And so, in that case, on the less than half-filled side, the more valence electrons, the more bonding. And molybdenum, which is in group 6, is basically right in the sweet spot where we get the maximum amount of bonding. So that means zirconium has a lower melting point than molybdenum, 
And of course, the melting point of molybdenum is incredibly high.